Welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. Here's your host, Tom Bourne. Hi, and welcome to Health and Safety Conversations. I'm your host, Tom Bourne, and with me today is the absolute awesome Chuck Casto. Chuck, how are you? Good, Tom. How are you doing today? Have a good day. Oh, I had a good day. It must be early over in the United States now. What time yeah, is it over it's there? A little, it's, it's a little early, but I'm I'm one of those 24-7 kind of people, you know. I'm up 24-7, whatever it takes. I do a lot of international work, so it's it's uh, typical for me to be up in the middle of the night. Excellent. Uh, Charles, you've had a, a very long and very distinguished career. You really have. Um, tell me. Yeah. Oh, can you tell the listeners a little bit about you if they haven't already heard of you? Yeah, Tom, I think the key word you had there is long career. <laughs> I'm a, uh, I've had quite a long career. I actually started uh, in the military about 50 years ago. This, this summer will be 50 years that I actually started to work. Uh, so it's been quite a long career. I, I had time in the military and Air Force, and mainly in the nuclear weapons program and some other things. Uh, the last 10 years now, uh, I've been a consultant in the nuclear industry and other industries on safety. Uh, my focus is uh, extreme crisis leadership. I've also uh, I spent 28 years with the nuclear regulator in the United States. I'm a former reactor operator and instructor for, in the nuclear industry, worked at several nuclear plants. So, um, that's uh, that's pretty much a thumbnail of it, Tom. Yeah. How did you get into um, working in the nuclear industry to start with? Well, I, I when I went into the Air Force, I, I uh, had the choice of some programs to go to, and and uh, you know, nuclear. I, I grew up in the shadows of uh, Shipping Port Nuclear Plant, which was one of the, one, if not the first commercial nuclear reactor in the United States. So I was, I grew up about eight miles from it. I was always intrigued by it, you know, the fences and the, everything that goes on. And, and at that time, of course, Cold War stuff. And, uh, as I, as I grew up, Cold War stuff. So it, uh, intrigued me. The nuclear business kind of intrigued me. And one of the options I had when I went in the military was to work with nuclear weapons. So I thought, well, there's a good, there's a good avenue to go. And then eventually when I left the military, I went into commercial nuclear business and, uh, the rest is history. Uh, working with nuclear weapons, did it ever worry you? Uh, no, no, no. It was uh, really safe. Actually, I worked on uh, 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 the disposal end of it, basically of uh, of hazards. So if a if a nuclear weapon had an event, we would go in and and either um, dismantle it or disarm it, whatever it needed. You know, if it had some kind of an accident or something happened with the, the weapon. And uh, we we were trained on almost every nuclear weapon that the United States has to to render it safe. Good, good. All right. Um, my first interest came about for you because of your work with the uh, Fukushima nuclear disaster, which happened in two thousand eleven. Um, hard not to that believe. long ago. Yeah. Hard, yeah. To, hard to believe. Twelve years ago. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, what well, at the time? So March eleven. What were you doing at the time? Were you? <laughs> yeah, I tell a story. I was. Uh, I was actually working for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the federal regulator here in the United States. But I was working in construction. I was overseeing the inspection of construction of some new nuclear units. I wasn't in the operations business at all, uh, so I wasn't connected. That Friday, we had just come back from a nuclear conference in Washington D.C. Um, I really wasn't connected to the events at all, or other than that eventually when it appeared on television. But from the nuclear perspective, since I was in construction, wasn't really connected to it. I was, uh, I was actually, I think when I really came aware of it, I was, I was, <laughs> I was fueling my pickup truck and my neighbor called me and said, Hey, Chuck, what's going on with this nuclear plant in Japan? And he gave me a description of it which I hadn't heard of it at that point. And uh, I said, well, it's going to be okay, John. Uh, you know, they'll get the emergency diesel generators back and they'll repower the systems and, and it'll recover. Everything will be fine. <laughs> I, 
they obviously couldn't have been more wrong. And uh, later on, when he when he found out that they sent me to Japan to lead the American effort there, he said, well, "You of all people, you, Mister, everything's going to be okay. You were the one they sent." I said, well, "Yeah, well, I was. I had that part wrong." So, uh, yeah. And then, then uh, immediately, uh, they were looking for the, the prime minister had called President Obama and asked him for some help on the nuclear part of the triple disaster in Japan, the earthquake, the tsunami, and the nuclear disaster. He asked for his help on the technical end of the nuclear disaster. And uh, President Obama called the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, said, hey, we need to, we need to help them. They decided to send a team to Japan. And um, I was chosen to lead that American team, which eventually became um, the, all of the federal government response, uh, leading the, the whole government response in Japan, which another other agencies that responded, EPA, DOE, all those. So I represented the U.S. government to the prime minister's cabinet, um, stayed there for, was assigned there uh, for uh, just about a year um, to uh, help and aid it, and primarily also give um, advice to the Japanese, or to the American ambassador in Japan, John Ruse, at the time, uh, who obviously wouldn't have a background in nuclear energy. And um, so I spent a, a mo- great deal of my time advising uh, Ambassador Ruse. Mm. So you're fueling, fueling up your pickup. <laughs> uh, you still think it's it's under control. When did you first just start to get an inkling that perhaps the diesel generators weren't yeah. coming back and perhaps we're yeah. going to have a situation? Yeah. Well, as I watched it, you know, I could really not see any. I mean, it was hard to see because the, the video cameras were far away. It was hard to see, but, but I didn't hear uh, about a, a robust response to the event from the Japanese. And, and, um, uh, I didn't see anything that looked like that they were aggressively uh, trying to recover the plant. So it you know, came hours and hours and hours without really hearing anything about a response um, and not seeing anything. And then, of course, when Unit 1 exploded, that told the whole story. And when that happened, that was, you knew at that point, okay, this is, uh, this is the worst case scenario here that we're faced with. Yeah, yeah. So they had six generators at Fukushima. Th- three were offline already. Right. Yeah, they had three in the outages and uh, some stage of outage. And then uh, units one, two, and three uh, were operating. Reactors, were they fairly old, fairly new? Uh, older, the... Uh, Unit one was one of the oldest models that we have, general electric reactor, um, old boiling water reactor, uh, old, very old technology. Two and three were more modern. They were the fourth generation reactor out of six, built obviously in the seventies and, and operated. Um, so, uh, familiar technology that's, uh, in fact, I worked on one of the reasons I was chosen was because I worked on that identical reactors of two, three, and four as a reactor operator and as an instructor. I literally was a sister unit to the Fukushima and Brown's Ferry nuclear plant in Alabama. So one of the reasons I was, I was chosen was because I had hands-on experience. I was a licensed reactor operator and instructor. So, um, you know, I had a lot of knowledge of how that plant operates, even though, <clears throat> you know, you certainly, you, you soon learn when you get there, and it's no longer a BWR uh, four reactor at that yeah. point. Right? It's it's something different, uh, but it started out as a BWR four reactor. But once you have the accident, it's a completely different situ- situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those who still somehow hold a, a great mis- mystery around nuclear power, can you just give them a, a little explanation of how simple it is? for nuclear uh, power stations to operate and how they do that? Well, they, you know, it, it, it really is just like a, like a fossil plant, you know, but they just they use new nuclear fuel in the, in the reactor vessel. So you're pumping water. It's a closed loop system. 
with a heat exchanger to a river or a lake or a, or an ocean. So uh, if you circulate water through the reactor, it turns to steam, the steam turns a turbine, which turns a, an electrical generator, produces electricity, and then the steam condenses and you pump it back through the reactor again in just a never ending cycle um, to, to produce electricity. And they, the thing that generates the heat is the uh, uranium decaying? Uranium, the uranium the uranium fission process, yep. uh, the splitting of atoms that uh, give off heat uh, from the particles traveling through the through the, the moderator, which is water. And so that the fission products and uh, the heat generates from the fuel, the fuel transfers heat to the water and uh, makes steam. And the BWR is a single loop. The reason we differentiate a boiling water reactor is that the inside the reactor vessel, at the top of the reactor vessel, the water steams, it's under pressure, but it steams and goes over the turbine and makes electricity. A pressurized water reactor is a solid system on that. It has two loops. So there's two loops. This, the primary loop is a closed system that um, is always solid with water. And then that water um, uh conducts with a heat exchanger that it acts just like the reactor, just like the boiling water reactor. Then that heat exchanger produces steam at the top, pumps it over. So you have, you have two different, basically two different kinds of light water reactors of boiling where the boiling occurs in the reactor vessel or pressurizer where, where it occurs in what they call steam generator. And realistically, despite uh, some of the stuff you hear in the media, it's a very clean process, isn't it? They're, they're basically right. the byproduct that comes off is steam, isn't it? Right, right. Yeah, zero carbon. No carbon reactors do not release uh, any carbon at all. So it's a from a from a from an environmental perspective, it's a zero carbon source. Yeah. Um, so what happens when, like this case, the generators fail and therefore no water is being pumped into the system. What's what basically right. happens then? Well, of course, you have safety systems that produce the pump water in the, in the system. But if you eventually, if you run out of electricity for long enough, right, then you don't have a pumping system. And it has turbine driven, it has steam driven systems as well. But all of that eventually, after uh, after a while, will will decay off. And you have no way to put water back in the reactor. And of course, the reactor, even when it shut down, which it did immediately uh, on on um, three eleven, uh, they shut down immediately. Even that, you have decay heat. Imagine like your stove. If you have an electric range, you know you you shut off the heat, the, the electricity. But if you touch a range top on some electric ranges, uh, it's still hot for a while. It yeah. takes some time to remove what's called decay heat. So about 7%, there's about 7% of the energy that's still released after you shut the reactor down. You have to remove that heat. And uh, it takes a while to do that. And meanwhile, if you lose uh, water supply, then the reactor fuel starts to heat up. The zirconium that holds the fuel starts to heat up. And eventually you reach a melting point of the uranium and the, and the zirconium. And you have uh, fuel damage. Yeah, yeah. And... Um... When the zirconium heats up, it gives off hydrogen. It produces one of the. Uh, it separates. It separates the high radiation and the heat. Separate the hydrogen from the oxygen in the water. Yep. Hydrolysis, and uh, that separates that hydrogen oxygen. And the hydrogen uh, collects, and uh, the containment is designed to hold that for a while, um, and uh, at some point. Um, in this case, that containment pressure continued to build because they were not removing heat, and uh, the hydrogen was released through several mechanisms. The hydrogen was released and um, and then ignited, and that's where you saw on television the the buildings exploding. First first time ever we uh, captured um, explosion at a nuclear power yeah. plant. Yeah, what I say is the first web stream nuclear accident. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Even though, even though, as you said, that the cameras were far away, you still got right. A bit you of... can understand, right? Six hundred feet in the air, the roof went. So uh, that's quite an explosion. Yeah. All right. Um, if 
for those who aren't familiar with the background, how did this happen? What what was the catalyst to all of this happening? Well, the earthquake was about a 9.0. It was felt as far away as Antarctica. It generated uh, actually uh, three sets of three tsunamis uh, waves. And, and you know, people think tsunami is, you know, the tsunami wave is like a wave at the beach and you dive through the wave and on the other side. It's actually a lifting of the ocean. So when you lift that ocean and it moves inland, that does an immense amount of force created. It, it's still baffled. It just baffled me and, and is stunning. Every time I go there and I looked at the amount of damage that was caused by water, you know, water movement. Um, so the tsunami, uh, tsunami moved in sh- on shore. Uh, the plant was not uh, protected enough from that tsunami and it breached the, the seawall that they have there and struck the plant part and flooded the plant primarily. And that flooding, unfortunately, the emergency diesel generators were in the basement of the building. Um, supposed to be watertight, but uh, not along with the batteries that would power some of the safety systems after the emergency diesel generators were lost. Then you have some electrical batteries. All that was wiped out by the tsunami. So the uh, there was literally uh, very little. For the safety systems operated for a while. Some of them operated completely as designed, uh, but the event, uh, long-term loss of offsite power, station blackout, it's called. Uh, well, the station blackout long-term, uh, the plant just can't survive. Mm. So you get the call. You you have to leave for Tokyo with very short notice. Yeah. Okay. When you're heading over there, any um, reservations about going into what you're going to experience? No, I, I, I didn't. Uh, you know, for me, it was a nuclear Super Bowl, and uh, you know, I was going to get to be the quarterback for the Americans. So uh, <laughs> I was, uh, and you know, I had history. Um, I had a lesser events that I'd been involved in, and I was involved in a, a release in a, in a fuel damage event in Hungary where I responded with the International Atomic Energy Agency to an event that happened in 2005 in Hungary with their spent fuel, their used fuel system, where they released, uh, they caused some damage to spent fuel, released some radioactivity to the environment. So I was dispatched then. Uh, So I had that experience, plus lesser events involved in our reactors here in the United States. Uh, So didn't have much trepidation about going um, you know, obviously I'd never been to Japan before, didn't know the language, didn't know the people, culture, anything. So I had to come up to speed very quickly on that, which fortunately I did. Um, and, uh, I, I was trying to, there, I had a manual with me. It was one of our training manuals, which described this event, long-term loss of offsite power in detail. It was a study done by Dr. Dana Powers. And, um, so I had that on the flight with me. So I'm thinking as I fly over to Japan that I will study this manual, it'll explain the accident to me and I'll have great, great wisdom. Well, <laughs> didn't really work out that way. Uh, on the flight over, uh, I had a logo shirt on and we were obviously it said something, you know, U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The flight crew saw that and we were headed to Japan and they knew about the accident. And so they were very, very concerned about the accident and um they actually had a they had, i was i was you know as a government employee i was back in with the pigs and the chickens and the cows uh, in the back of the airplane so they pulled me up front in the first class and said here's your seat right i thought they were going to throw me off the airplane i, I didn't know why they called me up because it's like i didn't cause the accident i'm going to help with it so um they put me in a first class seat and then literally uh, the rest of the flight the flight crew came up one of one of the time or in groups asking questions, you know, should we be flying to Japan? Why is this company flying us over there? You know, uh, they had, so I ended up spending most of my time consoling the flight crew rather than studying the manual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you touched down in Tokyo. Yeah. What's, what, what's, what's waiting to greet you? Well, it was uh, quite exciting. Uh, I, I went to the embassy American embassy. And uh, at that time, there was a video conference about to start 
they'd asked me, the, the ambassador's uh, aide had asked me if I'd seen this email. Uh, it was actually an email from the U.S. military making some demands, let's just call them, uh, some statements about what needed to be done in, with this accident. Of course, at that time, there was no Wi-Fi on airplanes, so I was like, no, I haven't seen the email. So he shoved it in front of me, and we went into a secure video uh, with a lot of stars, guys with people with stars on their on their epaulets, and um, they had a very testy, very testy conversation. So that was my in, in, introdu in, uh, introduction to uh, to the politics of the event. Uh, of course, you know, as you might imagine, rightfully so, the American military is very conservative. Um, if you have a leak on a submarine, that's a big deal. If you have some kind of event on a submarine, that's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, on a land-based big reactor like this. I mean, we're accustomed to small leaks and, and, you know, events quite often. It's not as sensitive. You're not in a tube, you know, a thousand feet underwater. So, um, it, there's just a, a completely different culture. And in addition, the, uh, U.S. military was very concerned. Uh, because the uh, USS Reagan aircraft carrier had trans, uh, uh, they had gone through the, uh, they, they went through the plume. Uh, so it was, it was 200 miles away. They had detected radiation and their aircraft were contaminated. So, uh, the American military was very concerned about, you know, where's, when and where, how big is the next release? There is there going to be another release. How big is it? So they, of course, <laughs> you might imagine. They wanted all the answers right away. Yeah. We didn't have the answers. You know, it wasn't our <laughs> reactor. Um, and even the Japanese didn't have the answers because, as you know, Tom, when this happened and you lose all the power, you lose all your instrumentation. So you lose all your senses. You lose your sight, your hearing, everything. Um, I, I, I always say it's like, it's like trying to solve a murder without access to the crime scene. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's very difficult very difficult to do so there really were no answers but uh, the american military in particular was was interested in answers right away yeah yeah when you got there what what measures had the japanese already taken to try and prevent meltdown well they had tried a great deal <clears throat> some successful some not the uh i think uh the most innovative and novel uh, actions that they had taken was the, the people at the plant had uh, harvested uh, batteries from automobiles that were many of them destroyed during the tsunami but they harvested batteries from the automobiles tied them together electrically and uh, <clears throat> powered back some of their instrumentation so they could see uh, see the condition of the reactor from the government side, I think a lot of the focus was on um, bringing large batteries to the station. Unfortunately, it was a it was an impossible task. The batteries were too heavy for helicopters to lift. So they really and and the roads, as you know, Tom, were destroyed. So getting wasn't a viable solution either. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's very few solutions uh, with regard to regaining power supplies um, for the station yeah yeah so yeah i believe at one stage uh the senior management of of tepco uh actually believed there were batteries on site that could be used uh and were basically told in no uncertain terms they were well and truly gone yes uh uh, there was a lot, you know, people thought about there were portable generators, which some they did use portable generators, but <clears throat> they were not uh, sufficient and uh, very difficult, even if you, the, you know, the the issue became, so you have a, let's say you have a pump with a motor on it. Do you, do you repower the, the like the circuit breaker, the box in your home? Yeah. Do you repower the circuit breaker box or do you go right to the motor um, and repower the motor, right? Mm -hmm. So that you didn't have enough energy, literally, figuratively and literally enough energy to do both. So which strategy? So they struggled with, okay, do we repower the, the, the panel or do we repower the, the motor? Um, which would be very difficult, especially in a, 
the motors, especially because they're closer to the reactor, reactors give you off massive amounts of radiation. Uh, and so it's in, you know, it's inhabitable from people perspective. So, it, and remember the, the, the physical structure of the plant had been altered quite a bit. Uh, it was hard to find things. Uh, it was uh, dark at night, uh, cold water. A couple of operators had drowned in the facility. Uh, so, um, and then continuing earthquake, massive uh, continuing aftershocks. And each one of them, you'd have to shelter until it was over. So, uh, you know, impossible situation. So they basically decided to put the power towards the instrumentation so they actually can see or yeah, right. see see what's going on. Right. And they're left with this solution that how are they going to do the cooling of the cores? Is that is that right? Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. But they had very limited options, didn't they? Very limited. They, uh, you know, there were. Uh, they did use fire trucks, and they dispatched. You know, and you and you might imagine the fire trucks and other in the communities nearby. If you could get them there with the roads, they're occupied doing other things. There was a oh, tsunami yeah. and an earthquake, right? So how do you get it? So, so basically, what they got was like the oldest fire trucks, you know, in the area. Uh, and so small in size, you know, untrustworthy in terms of operations, but they did get a lot of fire trucks, I think 75 fire trucks, and uh, they connected them to a fire header. This fire header in these BWR reactors is like the backup of the backup of the backup of the backup for cooling, where you could connect the fire header into the reactor system and pump water. So we had one at Browns Ferry. We had a system. We could, if we needed to, we could pump river water into the reactor uh, for cooling. The challenge became um, if you put too much water in a reactor, several things can happen. Is is you could you could uh, put so much water in there, it would overpressurize the, the building, the head of water in there could overpressurize. But more importantly, because the building was leaking, um, the water would go to the ocean. So you would have highly radioactive water being pumped to the ocean. That was a that was a huge challenge. The prime minister had decreed, you guys will not do that. You will not pump highly radioactive water to the ocean, which limited uh, the flooding of the plant. Yeah. Um, on the reactors themselves, I believe they uh, they they had a spot st storing the uh, used fuel rods, which they still have to keep cool as as they continue to decay because they're still generating heat. That's right. And that was on top of the buildings? It was on top. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, uh, you know, for the design, the spent fuel pool, which is 40 feet deep, full of water, heavy, big structure, keep the most, the, <laughs> the used fuel that's the hottest, Yep. They had another used fuel facility, facility off, uh, outside the buildings. That fuel was very old. Was The decay heat had been removed and could be cooled just by uh, storage in a pool. And actually, it could be cooled in air. Um, but the, the, the hottest fuel that's been removed from the reactor is stored in the spent fuel pool, which is in the air, usually on the fourth floor of the building and, and a swimming pool. So that became a huge problem after the explosion, the debris that was in the spent fuel pool, um, the inability to pump water into the spent fuel pool, and then the structural stability of the spent fuel pool um, from the tsunami and any um, future tsunamis was a yeah. big concern. Yeah, because the con one of the concerns was that they were going to continuously have, with the aftershocks, an ongoing tsunami event happening right right so we were very worried that another tsunami another big tsunami would cause structural damage to the spent fuel pool yeah what did it sounds interesting because i know the answer but i don't know if everyone else knows what did they try to do to actually cool those sp spent fuel rods you mean in the spent fuel pool yeah uh the uh so they they had a helicopter drop 
exactly. Just like you drop for a forest fire, they had a helicopter drop, which really was ineffective because it was a windy day, and you could see on the video that the that the water just blew away, basically. Uh, but the 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 positive side of that is, in my mind, um, they had they were what I call frozen in in action. That, that you know there was it was almost a hopeless situation so it was like you know there's nothing we can do this thing is just going to go where it goes you know literally they didn't say that and they were working to 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 recover but i think the overall sense was especially after the unit uh three explosion which yeah. uh the, the plant manager um, um yoshida saw Mm -hmm. uh, had, you know, he had said that's not it's not going to happen. We're going to keep Unit Three from exploding, and it did. And they were very dis disheartened. But I think earlier for Unit One, the the drop of this the water, while not effective, gave them the sense of hey, we can do something. We can we can get we can take actions. Right? We can. So I think it's it it served to snap them out of that inaction. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of inaction, leadership at the higher levels of the company and then uh, political, uh, I won't say interference, political maybe ineptness. Did that yes. play a part? Oh, it did. And, and uh, had, a, had a big impact on the operators that were trying to recover the plant. Uh, you know, they were... Um, when when uh, Prime Minister Khan went to the station, and I, I have a lot of uh, uh, thoughts about Prime Minister Khan and his abilities, and uh, both positive and negative. But the, one of the negatives was, uh, you know, he he went to the station in the middle of the event. As you know, your Prime Minister or your President typically go to an event um, after the initial response, right? Yeah. Whether it's a or hurricane, whatever it is, you go after the initial response. He went during the response, uh, and let's just say it was not a positive experience for the station. And uh, and the corporation, he had a four-hour meeting uh, with their corporation in Tokyo and then went to the station. Uh, it was demoralizing uh, for them. Um, and uh, so that that was not helpful. In, in the federal government, the national government, I can go through all of them, but there was four occasions where they stepped in. I mentioned one of them, no water to the ocean. There were four, um, there were four times that they stepped in. And my opinion is basically all four times they were wrong. It was mm -hmm. the wrong thing to do. The thing that they ordered was the wrong thing to do. Um, so that, that comes from, you know, <laughs> being so detached from the event that, uh, you know, crisis leadership, especially stream crisis leadership, is so complex. Um, you can have, you can be too detached from the event, um, and so not have a good understanding of what's going on and make some bad decisions. And also, if you're too close to the event, uh, one the the thing that differentiates extreme crisis leadership from any other leadership is the mortality, your own mortality. So, in an extreme crisis, you're worried about your own mortality mortality so the the fight or flight instinct kicks in and you have to as a leader you have to overcome that uh to lead through the event so um both situations can be bad being detached and also uh, the mortality salience of being in the midst of something as you asked tom my question about on the flight over were you worried about coming over right um so you have to uh you have to offset that um, belief that you're going to die yourself as a leader, mm. uh, and which will which will alter the way you make decisions and in your actions. If for some people, for most people, it would. Yeah, the operators, from what I've read, at least because obviously I haven't spoken to them, the operators on the ground, they're the true heroes in this, aren't they? <laughs> absolutely. But if you talk to them, they will absolutely deny that. But um, they are, you know, I've called him a hero many, many times. And, and Inagaki and others that were the leaders there keep saying we're no heroes. Uh, but I understand why they're saying that, because they, they feel responsible for the accident. It's or not. Uh, they did the best they could with what they had, where they were at. Um, yeah. 
they, they no, I could never second guess what they did. Um, and, and, uh, but they, they, they limited the damage. I would say, um, you couldn't prevent it. It was, it was unpreventable given the, the design yeah. of the facility. Uh, it was preventable. It was a preventable accident, but, um, at the time it was not preventable because they hadn't taken the action. You know, they had been given it, they had been given, uh, indications that the tsunami would be 45 feet high. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, didn't take actions to raise the tsunami wall at yeah. the station. Onagawa, the station north of them, different utility, they did raise the tsunami wall. And they, uh, a year earlier, they finished that wall. It defended the station against the tsunami. And in fact, the city of Onagawa was wiped out by the tsunami and the nuclear plant was used as a shelter. How good is that compared to what actually happened at Fukushima? <laughs> right. All right. Um, is it true that one stage senior executives in TEPCO were strongly considering abandoning the power station? That's, you know, that's a question that can never be answered because we, we don't know. I mean, there's been a lot of debate about that situation, about that, um, and interpretation. You know, if you talk, I've talked to Yoshida, he's, he's, he's since passed, but, you know, I talked to Yoshida when I was there. Um, Clearly, he intended to keep a core set of people back, mm. and uh, the un um, what do you call them? The unnecessary, the uh, the unessential, the non-essential is what I'm word I'm looking for. The non-essential personnel he wanted to you know get out of harm's way. So I think that was his intent. I don't think, and also, I mean, I had been, I had, um, I'd been assured by the Japanese government that the site was not going to be evacuated. So, um, you know, I think it's an uh, interesting question. I don't, there was no deliberate decision by TEPCO to say, we're, we're just going to walk away from this. That, that wasn't, that never but, happened. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, it wasn't much of an option because if they did, there was another power plant that would be in the direct radiation path from the release, which that also would then... Right. Uh, no, right. Yeah. Dainee yeah. was, uh, Dainee is really the true story of this. Uh, the other station is really the true story hit by the same, same tsunami. Uh, one of the diesel generators survived. Yep. And that helped them greatly. But it's the, the Dainee story is an amazing story. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, what was the key point that, tipped it back towards at least being, well, not being out of control, brought it back yeah. into some sort of realm of control? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really good question. You know, when they, when they pumped the seawater in, that was the turning point. Um, you know, and once they got seawater flowing into the reactors, then it, it, we learned at Three Mile Island, uh, from the Three Mile Island accident, almost any amount of water mm -hmm. on the fuel the damaged fuel will cool it. Uh, it does, it, it, uh, so, so if you can get some water in there, now there's a minimum that's supposed to go in. Mm -hmm. It has a unfortunate term, uh, acronym. It's called the murder rate. Uh, it's a minimum, <laughs> the minimum water that needs to go in the, in the reactor, um, to keep it, keep that fuel cool. They were not able to reach that level. They did not reach the minimum level. But they did some. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the reason they didn't reach the, the minimum level was because of that issue with releasing water to the ocean. Yeah. So they had to keep they had to keep the water throttled back. Uh, and but that that meant that there would be more damage uh, because you kept the water throttled back below the minimum flow rate. But it protected the ocean. And there was some reluctance, at least in the company level, to actually. Uh pump seawater in at one stage why is that and the government and the government yes uh and the government and the company um both were hesitant uh because it you know you knew as a, as a reactor person you know salt water in a reactor that's a, that's a death blow to that reactor so you've completely lost that accident so again 
you know, not having the right perspective at corporate and in, you know, hundreds of meters away, uh, kilometers away in Tokyo, um, you don't have the right perspective. And, you know, so they're thinking that there's, you know, someday we'll recover this, recover this reactor and continue to operate, but seawater would prevent that. Um, that was the wrong picture. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 no, someone probably hadn't explained to them that there was two alternatives here. You either do the seawater yeah. or we have a complete meltdown. Meltdown, right. That's right, which eventually happened anyhow. But Yeah. Um, All right. Um, how much radiation was released compared to, say, um, Chernobyl? I, I think I've seen numbers like, one to ten percent of what we released at Chernobyl. I don't know that for certain, but it actually was not a great deal of radiation released. Uh, of course, you know my old adage is, you know, any if it's measurable, it's bad because people, you know, it doesn't matter that it's below limits, yeah. uh, whatever. You know, that doesn't matter if if you can measure it and you can talk about it. The people, the public, can say, I don't want it in my backyard. Yeah, yeah. And that brings me to my, one of my other points. I was just going to say, it's it's over 10 years since there, but I, I was reading figures from last year at least that there's been less than 40% of the people who left the area actually return. And there's no evidence that the radiation there would actually impact on their health Right. more than anywhere else that that's right there are yeah. other places on earth that are have much higher radiation levels background radiation maybe even denver colorado i don't know but for sure but there are places on earth that people live that have higher radiation levels than what exists there if we were to speculate do you think it would just be the fear factor that's that's playing a part there i i think you know people moved on they found new new places to live it's an agrarian society. Anyhow, the population was declining to begin with because people, you know, it's it's mostly subsistence farming. And, uh, you know, these, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I apologize to all the younger people out there, but the, the kids, you know, these younger people, they're not too, not too many I'm interested in. Uh, you know, I'm going to go out and farm, you know, for my subsistence. So, uh, you know, the population was declining anyhow moved on you know people moved to cities in general um so uh, and then the older people I, I imagine there was some trepidation by some people to go back but i think everybody who wanted to go back could go back yeah yeah um when they did the uh, evacuation around the plant uh, look I, what i've read is they th three different evacuation sizes as they did it do you think that was adequate and justified at the time? Well, at the time, it was probably it was probably the right thing to do because you didn't know the future. Mm. It wasn't justified for the if it, this makes any sense, Tom. Wasn't justified for the dose rates that were existing in those areas. Mm -hmm. they, they were not um, it was not really sufficient to evacuate people. Could have sheltered people, um, but the uncertainty about what was going to happen, you know, was prudent to evacuate people. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, things have moved on since then, apparently. Um, could you see this happening again, or was it just a unique event where we had uh, earth, massive earthquake, massive tsunami, and then throw in the, the failure of a nuclear power plant? Well, you, as a nuclear safety guy, you have to always imagine something bad can happen. You know, the, the, one of the, I say the, one of the root causes of the Fukushima event was failure of an imagination. That you didn't imagine it could happen. So if you don't imagine it could happen, you don't prepare for it. So you have to, in, in our business, you have to continue to imagine every day that something bad can happen and you better prepare for it. Right. So whether or not it can or can't happen, we have to assume that it can happen and we have to look for countermeasures and try to improve our system, seek excellence, seek a, a strong safety culture, always on a journey of continuous improvement to prevent, to, to limit the likelihood of it happening. 
but be prepared for the consequences if it does. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Changing tact. Casto Consulting. What do you uh, do? What do you do? I do a lot. I, I do a, obviously a lot of consulting. I, I'm on many uh, what are called nuclear safety review boards. So it's an independent board to look at the safety of reactors. I do. A, I work for a lot of fleets, a lot of reactors around the world. Still work for TEPCO. Um, I make that disclosure. I still work for them. I'm actually working for them in the restart of their Kajawazaki Kariwa site, which is the which is on the west coast of, of Japan. We're looking to work hard to restart that BWR reactor. Uh, and um, I do a lot of uh, um, consulting, a lot of education. I work for the Naval Postgraduate School to do some teaching there. Other places, I do a lot of lectures um, and a lot of some reviews of events that have occurred. And uh, so I had a lot of irons in the fire. We do. And I have uh, many um, associates that can do almost anything that, uh, you know, in a technical, in an engineering field. We have a lot of people that work with us uh, to provide us uh, assets and resources to, to uh, uh, I just did a, 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 some consulting on uh, safety in uh, the North Sea, uh, oil and gas platforms in the North Sea, an energy company there. So uh, a lot of health and safety. Uh, work. So excellent. All right, that's um, my advert. That's that's my commercial. Well, yeah. absolutely. And and you're available to help anyone who needs you, right? I do. I do. I get calls, and uh, whether it's uh, you know expert witness for testimony for court cases, uh, what whatever it is, and if and, and and typically we have the resources. You know, I have associates um, that that can cover almost any topic, uh, any technical topic that uh, that, that people uh, need help with. You've also written a couple of books, Station Blackout, uh, which is uh, about Fukushima, but also you've got a book called Extreme Crisis Leadership. All right. right. Where, where can we go to get a copy of these? Well, they're, they're both on Amazon, uh, Station Blackout, inside the... the uh, it's like Fukushima nuclear disaster and recovery. Um, that's obviously available on Amazon or any any bookstore. Uh, and then uh, likewise, the, the handbook, the second book is actually a handbook uh, for uh, extreme I mean, crisis leadership, uh, technical crisis leadership. Uh, I had I wanted to build a manual handbook that uh, people who don't expect to be in an extreme crisis, whether it's a theater operator that has an active shooter, whatever the situation is, uh, that you don't, that you find, I had a, I had a, a cyber person, uh, leader who was, uh, had one of these, um, where they take over your computer and, and, uh, for the state government, for the, for one of their prefectural governments. And, uh, she had used my first book as a for sort of a roadmap to respond to that, uh, to that event. So it made me think, well, I need to extract the lessons learned from there and have a handbook that people can go to very simply and go to and say, these are the things you need to think about uh, if you find yourself faced with an extreme crisis. Now, that's good, Chuck. All right, Chuck, our time seems to be running out. So I'd just like to say thank you again for uh, coming on. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you on. Um, but for now, um, have to say goodbye and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you, Tom. Anytime. Appreciate what your work and what you're doing promoting the uh, health and safety conversations. Thank you very much, Chuck. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for listening to Health and Safety Conversations with Tom Bourne. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your week.